This is an honor for here on the Rich Eisen Show on the 41st anniversary of the miracle on ice, the goalie who stopped 36 of 39 shots to beat the Soviets and the man who called the action uh, for the Olympics, Jim Craig and Al Michaels here together on the Rich Eisen Show. Happy anniversary, guys. Uh, 41 awesome. years, it's amazing. Incredible. Al, must make you like 47 years old. Uh, I was I was actually seven, and you were you were two. I was two. I, don't we you know, wish? You don't know. Wish. I think back to uh, when we did uh, the wrap up show that night, the Sunday night after the Finland game, and Jim McKay uh, brings me in and Ken Dryden, and he he said, "Do you think this will live on for a while?" And I didn't want to say for sure because uh, otherwise. You know, in case it didn't, that would look like a dope. But if he would have said 41 years later, people are still talking about this and exulting, uh, that was a miracle. Yeah, kind of crazy, right? So, I mean, let's, if you don't mind, just let's start um, our chat here about the day. Uh, Jim, what, what, what are your recollections about waking up that day and starting your day, knowing what the day could actually hold for you, Jim? Well, you know, in your life, you always look at opportunities that you're going to get, and you you want to make the most of them. I, I just remembered in preparation, my preparation was so different for that game, uh, because we had played them in Madison Square Garden. I, I, I didn't play the whole game. I played some. It was a incredible as I look at it um, strategic thing that Herb did but for me to have played them before became so important to be be able to prepare for them for the second time right so you know I I looked at it in all honesty that if you played one period against the Russians it was equivalent to a whole game against any other team and so I, I broke the game into three separate games of four or five minute periods. And so I could concentrate and be really laser focused and then broke the game into like, you can't let them score in the third period because that was the most important momentum wise. And so when I did that, it, the game moved along faster and it was easier to uh, prepare. And, you know, goalie's position is so different because you can't go out and be excited. You have to react to the game. And, and really try to control the momentum in, in a very favorable way. Like if your team scores a goal, you try not to give up a goal very quickly. And momentum is such an important thing. And we had that home crowd and it had been building. And so for me, it was really the excitement of having this opportunity that so many people had helped me uh, along the way that I was, I was ready for it. You know, it was really fun for me. I, 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 I kind of like those type moments. What about you, Al? Uh, when I woke up that morning, I thought, well, you know, this is a, a very exciting time. And uh, it's a very exciting situation where the U.S. was able to get to the medal round, have the opportunity to face the best team in the world. But frankly, I was very fearful uh, of the fact that the Soviets could blow the U.S. team out. And uh, it could be four nothing or five nothing at the end of the first period. And I know when Ken Dryden and I walked over to the arena, our hotel was only four or five blocks away. I think I said something along the lines of if it's only three one Soviets midway through the second period, that's not bad. So they scored first uh, midway through the first period. And I'm thinking, oh man, you know, hold on, don't let it be two, three, four nothing. And then uh, we get a, a, the tying goal, and then they go ahead again, two to one. And then Mark Johnson scores that goal with no time left at the end of the first period. So we now have more than we asked for. The amazing thing to me about that game is it developed, and it was so interesting listening. I haven't heard Jim talk in those terms, even you know, 41 years later, listening to how he uh, broke that game down in his mind. The most important thing in that game was that Jim never allowed it to be a two-goal game. Never. It was one nothing Soviets. It was one one. 
It was 2-1 Soviets, it was 2-2. It was 3-2 Soviets, and they dominated the second period. Uh, outshot the U.S. team something like 16-3, to three, and Jim made a number of saves, you know, standing on his head. And that kept the U.S. in the game and enabled the tying goal to be scored midway through the third, and then, of course, the Arruzioni goal. And then it just got crazy. I mean, the last 10 minutes were insane. The Soviets are skating these crazy shifts on and off the ice every 20 seconds. The crowd is going going wild, and it was a, it was a one-off. And again, you know, you, you look at what Jim did in that game, how many times do you win a game when the team is outshot 39 to 16? So that was, that was, nobody anticipated what took place. How often do you watch it, Jim? How often do you actually sit there and watch it back? Ever? You know, I, I, I think I've truly in 41 years now watched the full game maybe once. Wow. And, you know, um, the, the point is, you know, we all wanted to become in the National Hockey League. American players had never been really accepted in the National Hockey League. And so you couldn't go in there and be proud of what you had accomplished because to them, you had accomplished nothing, right? And so you really could never, ever relax and feel good about what you accomplished because you are you always had another goal. And so as I've got older, I, you know, I, I really said, you know, my son is 32 years old. I said, you know, JD, we should just sit and watch this game. I should tell you about some of these things. And, you know, it, it, it's we're getting just to that age, Rich, where we don't care. You know what I mean? It's like, that was cool. I can say that because now I'm, I'm like that. I'm a grandpa. You know what I mean? I can, I can say those things. Nobody's going to critique me for being happy. And But it was never like that. So, you know, you never watch that because you always have a different goal in mind. Al, what about you? You know, a, a, a story I have to tell you, uh, this is the 41st anniversary, is last year, you know, pre-pandemic, it's the actual 40th anniversary. And the Vegas Golden Knights invited the whole team to come back and be honored before the game at T-Mobile Arena. And the crowd is chanting, USA, USA. This is 40 years after the fact. And at least two-thirds of the people in that building weren't even born when this took place, but they knew the story. They had played a little video beforehand. And to me, one of the most astonishing things after they announced that the team one by one, the guys came out walking off the ice, you know, to get back uh, underneath the, the stands, they had to pass by the, the, the golden Knights bench. And none of these guys were born at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of those guys weren't even from the United States, but they were all like leaning over the boards and hugging the American kids. It was like the American team yeah, right. down in their 60s. I'm going, it's almost as if everybody in the NHL understood what this meant to hockey in this country. I've got Jim Craig and Al Michaels here together on the 41st anniversary of the Miracle on Ice uh, here on the Rich Eisen Show. Jim, what, what did Herb Brooks say to you? Obviously, we've seen the movie Miracle and that remarkable speech that Kurt Russell uh, playing Herb gave to the team about moments that's a you know top-notch moment in, in in sports movie history but what what did herb say to you guys before taking the ice um in the medal round against the russians you know it's it's really interesting in in, in the work i do now which is motivational speaking i always tell people something i learned from herb that was really really important and and that was time management right and, you know, everybody thinks priorities, everything else, but the most important thing in time management is knowing how much time you have, because that drives all strategies, right? You, you, you can't, you don't know how to create a strategy unless you know how much time you have, right? And so Herb Brooks trained us and treated us the way he did because he only had six months, right? But when it came that night, he was our confidence. He absolutely believed in us. He absolutely loved us. Each of us individually, um, he knew how to take us to this different level. Um, he had recruited us specifically. And, you know, I, you know, when I wrote my book, We Win, one of the things in the studying of Herb that really became so apparent to me was when he said, you're not looking for the best players, you're looking for the right players. What he meant is, Players that, as a leader, you can coach. And players as leaders that you can get them to go to some place that they don't even know is possible without your help, 
right? And that's what great mentors do. So what Herb Brooks was able to do was to take each and every one of us and get us to that spot that we were prepared and he was proud and he was our confidence. So for me, it, it was different than it was for Mark Johnson, than it was for Mark Wells, than it was for Jack O'Callaghan, but it was the same because he had brought us to believe in a level. Like a lot of people want to tell, a lot of leaders want to tell people how to think instead of making people think. And, and Herb Brooks just had this ability to reach into your soul and see something that you, he was not going to let you get away with not getting to. Was, and, he, and he took on that responsibility. And, and so to me, the greatest thing about Herb was that he, he realized what our potential was and he treated us all differently to get there. And then when we got there, he became our competence and protector. And uh, if you have, want to have a real uh, thing, watch the game against Czech when Mark Johnson gets run by the Czech and he tells him he'll take that coho and stuff it right down. You know, and I can't even say the words, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, he, he, was a, he was a special man, a really special man. Now, what are your recollections of him? I mean, what, what was he... Was he tough to deal with from your perspective or, or what was it from your end with Herb Brooks, Al? I think it was very tough for the press, but for me, it was very simple. And for that, I can thank Ken Dryden because Ken, of course, had won the Stanley Cup multiple times, the Vezina Trophy in Montreal, and he had retired. And of course, Ken is unbelievably bright and uh, you know maybe the most book smart athlete I've ever maybe the most book smart person I've ever uh, encountered in my life. And so Herb had this affinity, you know, with, with Ken, and he wanted to pick Ken's brain. So as, yeah. as a consequence, on every off night, Brooks would come over to our hotel to have a, a couple of beers, you know, we'd have him for an hour. So we had the access to Brooks that nobody else had, thanks to Ken Dryden. But Brooks was as interested in what Kenny had to say as we were in trying to figure out, you know, what we could glean from what Herb had to say. He was a, a fascinating man listening to, you know, Jim talking about him. I can see exactly what he did. Uh, it all worked out perfectly. And, you know, just a, another quick story. In, in 2000, Sports Illustrated brought all the great athletes from the 20th century into Madison Square Garden for a for a show on CBS, and uh, they had the the top ten greatest sports moments of the 20th century, and this of course was number one. And they asked me to introduce it, and the team and Herb comes out, and the team gets the 14,000 people in the garden that night. Place goes crazy. So now we're walking down a little staircase to go behind the stage, and I'm walking next to Herb, and Herb says, "How could they vote that number one?" And I said, Herb, won't you ever understand? Please enjoy what you enjoy what happened. It's the greatest moment of the 20th century in sports, certainly in North America. So it was almost as if there was a part of Herb that just couldn't accept how fantastic this was to everybody else. You know, he was a coach through it. Through. Look, he could have been the king of America a, a, a week after the Olympics. What's he doing? He goes to Switzerland to coach a club team. He was a hockey coach. I love that stuff, man. I mean, that's just, uh, Jim, is there, is there a story that people don't know about this? Because again, it's 41 years. Al's, you know, mentioned again, it was a, a, the number one sports moment of an entire sports century. Um, my kids are 12, 10, and 7. They know the story because I made sure that at the very least they saw the movie Miracle. And then, of course, we start, we went to YouTube and showed them moments of, you know, you and, you know, your dad, obviously, and we showed them these moments and I get emotional just thinking about, I, I get, I, I tear up. I literally tear up because of what it meant to me in 1980, what it means to me now. Is there a story, a story that that's never been told or do we know everything about this, Jim? Well, you know, when you and the kids look at the movie and they see that I didn't take the test, that, you know, Disney asked me for some political uh, license there. Okay. What really happened, Herb was so bright 
that after my mother had passed away, that he had me live with a team doctor because I needed family, right? What I didn't know is that he checked in with a team doctor almost every single night. And when we got that Briggs Meyer or DIS type of assessment test, I, you know, I was always planning to take that test, but I did what I did every night. I called home and called my dad. And that particular night he was crying. He had just lost his job as a food service director to Amarac. And he, he didn't really know what to do. And so I had this aha moment that said, you know, how can I do my dreams with my families in a situation that they need support? But my mother had made me make a promise that I would never turn pro uh, if I had a chance to represent our country. See, the kids today don't understand it. It wasn't so much about being just an Olympian. It was about representing your country, right? And the Olympian part was how you did it. But it was always about the flag and, and, and pride, you know? And that's, that was my dad's generation. You know, that's what I grew up with. That's what I knew, right? And so, you know, I, I thought if I didn't take this test that Herb Brooks would send me home, I wouldn't break my mother's promise. And it would be really kind of an easy thing to do. I would go because obviously we weren't going to win. And, 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 you know, this was just me being selfish. What I didn't know is Herb Brooks knew all about that. And the part that he loved best was about my character, that if I was willing to give up being an Olympian to support my family, I was just the type of guy he wanted, right? And so here's what he said to me. He goes, can you do your job? I said, yeah, I can. He says, okay, I'm going to help you, Dad. And he got a loan from my, my family. Nobody knows that. And he, what he did is he got me at a, a comfort level so that I could go out and do what I wanted to do. If you look at Herb Brooks and you think of Warren Stralo, one of the greatest goalie coaches in the National Hockey League, right? Warren Stralo would never have been anything but a college goalie part-time coach without Herb Brooks. What Herb Brooks did is he saw a vision for Warren in that position. Now, everybody's got a goalie coach. It was nobody had a goalie coach. Then it was even a position. It wasn't a full-time job. Right. So here's Herb raising Warren to a level that Warren couldn't get to. Craig Patrick becomes a general manager because of Herb Brooks. The players become these things because of Herb Brooks. Right. And so he was a very unselfish man that was a teacher and a motivator. And if he didn't have chaos, he didn't know what to do because he did. He needed that. That was that was his kryptonite or you know what, whatever you want to call it. That was what it was that he wanted to do. And and he did it so well. And when people said he wouldn't be able to adjust when he had the pros, he adjusted and the pros loved him. You know what I mean? And so uh for me, he's been an incredible mentor. And so what he did that nobody knows about is he cared. He really cared about people. And why this last is because it was true and honest and not fabricated. The flag going over my shoulders wasn't some agent telling me how to do it. It was <laughs> an American bringing it to the stadium. They couldn't buy him there. They jumped on the ice that was touched by a moment, right? And, and so what we did and what we have is what America is all about. And that's why it lasts. That's amazing. Jim, you're amazing. Al, you too. I guess the last question I have here is clearly, you know, this game was played at five in the afternoon. Um, and uh, America is another part about it that's unbelievable uh, that wouldn't really go down today is that it was held for America to see later on tape delayed. Uh, at what point, Jim, did you and the uh, team hear the phrase, do you believe in miracles? When was the first time? Is there a story behind that, potentially, that you that actually came across you, that that Al's line that resonates still to this day today is one of the greatest lines in the history of sports broadcasting? When did, when did that ever reach you guys? Well, I just remember it's snowing in Lake Placid. Jim Lampley is taking my dad, uh, Mike Arizio, and his dad. We're walking down. People are surrounding us. And I think Jim, Jim Lampley said, you know, L. Michael's calls of, do you believe in miracles? And, you know, it was, it started there. But, you know, the greatest thing, Rich, is 
I'm now 60, almost four years old. Every day I learn the importance of what myself and my teammates were able to accomplish and how it affects people in such a positive way that that's the most refreshing thing. So people will ask me all the time, what's the greatest thing that ever happened to you from the Olympics? Well, when my mother died, so did my dad, right? Mm. But when those Olympics happened, my dad was reborn. You know, he was like the greatest gift there was. He was, he was just a proud dad of, a, of a, having a son who was able to be part of something that was bigger than ourselves. And so the gift is, it, it's something that I really feel that our team has taken as a responsibility to make sure that we are humble, respectful, and thankful for everybody who paved the way for us. And in our day, it was community, right? It was your town, it was your people who never made you feel bad if you didn't have any money or you needed to borrow something. It was getting rides from neighbors. It was, it was community, right? And, and that's what I truly think we represent. And, and, and that's important to me and I know it's important to my teammates. And, and Rich, just to weigh in, I mean, uh, you know, Jim talks about what it means 41 years later uh, to the people in this country. And I, I've said this a number of times, but it, it really resonates to me, is that, you know, when if you're of a certain age, you remember Pearl Harbor. I mean, you have to be really old right now, but you remember Pearl Harbor. Uh, a lot of us remember, obviously, when John Kennedy was assassinated. We remember when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. We remember when the Challenger blew up. We remember Oklahoma City. Obviously, we remember we remember 9-11, and now we can all remember the insurrection at the Capitol. Think about all of those events, all those events that people remember. Every one of them is terrible, except Lake Placid. That resonates in a completely different manner. And it's beautiful. And you live to the moment, Al. I mean, and, and you've done so many great things. I've told you this uh, personally as well. The fact that you live to the moment like that and 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 you found the economy of words to nail it to, um, it's quite something, Al, 41 years later. It's, like, it's, it's almost like they had the script before it happened. Yeah, you, you guys wrote the script. What I said came out of my heart. Yeah, Simple but you know, that. Al, the thing that's so amazing is Ken Dryden is so bright and a goalie sees the play going from and coming to. So you have a whole different perspective and to listen to him talk and see how excited he was and a, a very unpartial, unbiased, just such a professional person. It, it, it's, it's, it's crazy how good it is. It's, it, 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 it it's it's just too good. You know what I mean? It is. And then and then the amazing thing too is Kenny had never done this. It was the first time he'd gone into broadcasting. He had just retired. And I I met him in Moscow. We, we went over to uh, scout a tournament in, in December of 79. And we're sitting there having dinner. And Kenny is explaining to me in great detail the difference between National Hockey League hockey and international hockey. And he says to me at one point, do you think this is the type of thing the American audience will be interested in? And I said, Kenny, yes, but let me introduce you to the world of broadcasting. Can you get it down to eight seconds? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he but did. It, even the call like, you know, the, the U.S. is appending too much of Jim Craig and the Rizzioli scores. I mean, he Perfect. was so, I mean, everything he did was the timing of a, a person who had been there. You know what I mean? It was just fabulous. Fantastic. Well, yeah. I could say the same thing about this chat. Thank you so much, guys. It means so much to so many people. And I'm so thrilled that my that you allow me through my show to bring this to um, as many people as possible on such a special day. Yeah. Al Michaels, thank you. And Jim Craig, thank you. Yeah, Al, always love being, sharing some time. Two real yeah. professionals in your industry. It's, it's really fun to be able to share a little bit of time. And, you know, it's just a happy moment. It's, it's fun to remember. Thanks for sharing it with me. And we'll, we'll, do, we'll do 42 next year. I'm signing you up right now. Okay, buddy. Thanks, yeah, we'll Al. Look forward to it. That's uh, Al Michaels and Jim Craig here on The Rich Eisen Show. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.